Welcome to Session 1 of Integrated Pest Management for Multifamily Housing. This training was created by the Stop Pests Program at the Northeastern IPM Center, part of Cornell University. Stop Pests provides training and technical assistance for federally supported housing sites with funding from the USDA's National Institute of Food and Agriculture and HUD's Office of Lead Hazard Control and Healthy Homes. This training content was constructed around a research-based and objective approach to pest management and affordable housing and is intended to be used in its entirety. We do not recommend the partial use of these materials. Products, vendors, or commercial services mentioned or pictured in these trainings are for illustrative purposes only and are not meant to be endorsements. The content of these trainings was developed in collaboration with all of the agencies pictured here. This curriculum is a series of four interrelated classes, beginning with this session, the introduction. In this session, we will start by identifying the most problematic pest populations, move on to the rationale for using Integrated Pest Management, or IPM, and finish with the connection between pesticide use and occupant health. This course is not designed to license anyone to apply pesticides. Session 2 will focus on one of the three most problematic pest populations, cockroaches. Session 3 will focus on rodents, specifically mice and rats. We're saving bedbugs for Session 4. With each of the last three sessions, we will discuss the nature of each pest group, their life cycles, what they eat, and where and how they live. We have found that there is great value in understanding the way each group of pests survive as a way of learning how to control them effectively and safely. That is what IPM is all about, safely controlling pests while minimizing the health risks to the human occupants. Let's get started on session one. We'll briefly discuss the priority pests, but we will cover each of them in more detail in sessions two, three, and four of this series. Next, we will discuss the benefits of IPM, and lastly, wrap up this session talking about pesticides and their health impacts. This quote, insanity is doing the same thing over and over again and expecting different results, is often attributed to Albert Einstein. We believe that it is relevant to the topic of pest management. Think about how you fought pests in the past. What pests do you see? How do you currently deal with them? And is it working? Think about exterminating versus managing pests. Exterminating is an old term that the industry has moved away from, because relying on chemical sprays to kill all the pests simply hasn't worked for us. Pests have been around for thousands, even millions of years. We continually use stronger chemicals to fight them, yet they are still infesting our homes and our workplaces. Managing pests is the correct expression, and the one that will be used today. To manage pests, we must think beyond simply killing pests. Pest management is done with the help of a pest management professional, a PMP. With the help of is key. It takes a team to manage pests. Cockroaches, rodents, and bedbugs are the top three pests in affordable housing. Cockroaches contaminate food and leave both their poop, called frass, and shed skins behind. Their presence in a home can trigger asthma attacks and even cause asthma in infants. Rodents such as mice and rats, destroy property, can bite, and may even cause fires. Mice drip urine and leave their dander wherever they go, triggering asthma attacks and spreading disease. Bed bugs and their bites are a nuisance and are expensive to eliminate. The presence of pests violates housing codes. Pests also cause problems by leading people to overreact and ignore pesticide labels. In the next three sessions, we will cover each of these pests in detail so that you can understand their habits and needs and apply IPM-focused strategies for prevention and control. When we talk about integrated pest management, or IPM, what do we really mean? Integrated means using multiple approaches that work together. Pests are what the multiple approaches work to fight. And when we manage pests, we use the most economical means with the least possible risk to people, property, and the environment. Let's talk about what we refer to as the IPM program life cycle, the process that we recommend when implementing an IPM program. 
IPM is a decision-making process that emphasizes prevention, knowledge of pest biology, and the use of least disruptive control tactics with pesticides saved as a last resort. Notice we said process. At its most effective, IPM is considered to be a continuing cycle. In a structural setting, an IPM program consists of the following five steps. Number one, inspect and monitor. First, we inspect to determine if we have pests. Number two, identification. We want to be sure we know what the pest is so we know the best way to combat it. Number three, scale the response to the level of infestation. Knowing the level of infestation will help us to launch an appropriate response. For example, we would treat the discovery of three bed bugs differently than we would 300. Monitors will help us quantify the size of the infestation so that we can scale the response. Number four, multiple tools means employment of two or more control measures, which may be behavior change, mechanical, biological, or chemical. And number five, evaluation of effectiveness. How do we know if we've been effective? If we don't see pest activity, if our monitors back up that claim, and if our residents are not reporting pest sightings, it is very likely that we have been effective. Let's discuss the various roles that must be filled to implement an effective IPM program. IPM is not a one-person job. Everyone who lives or works in housing has a role or a position on the IPM team. While not all organizations have each of the job titles that we will list, these are all important roles that someone must fill. The IPM coordinator makes sure all pest management jobs are funded, completed, and recorded in the IPM log. Property management can't outsource the responsibility for quality assurance of an IPM program. Property managers are responsible for time and resource allocation at the property and often set the tone for resident involvement. The procurement specialist is responsible for reviewing the qualifications of pest management professionals and contracting for pest management services. Resident support services provide education and assistance for residents. The maintenance crew addresses moisture issues and makes repairs that block pest entry points. Janitorial or custodial services clean common areas. Residents must clean regularly and report maintenance issues and pest problems. Landscape services choose plants that are pest resistant and keep plants away from the building. Minimizing rat habitat and hiding spots should be considered when planting. The Pest Management Professionals, or PMP, follows the terms of the contract, conducts inspections, monitors pest populations, and applies pesticides that pose the least risk to human health and the environment. Education and record keeping are among the most powerful tools that can help to control pests. Education can result in behavioral changes that will make the property inhospitable to pests. Record keeping brings accountability to pest management and ensures the problems are fixed before the infestation grows. The responsibility for documentation and education should be shared by everyone involved in pest management. Let's discuss a few of the benefits of IPM. Cost savings. IPM results in lower pest management costs over time and is more sustainable than relying on sprays alone. A healthier building. IPM relies on products and practices that work together and minimize risks to humans. This means fewer asthma attacks, less human exposure to pesticides, and less of a chance staff will take pests home. IPM repairs will make the workplace healthier for staff, too. Many of us have family members with asthma or who are sensitive to or allergic to pesticides. Fewer complaints. Work orders will increase at first since residents and staff will be encouraged to use the work order system, but when repairs have been made for prevention, there will be fewer work orders than ever. A Boston Housing Authority development reduced cockroach work orders by 68% after only one year of IPM. Fewer pests. IPM results in longer-lasting control aimed at preventing pests, so we can stop infestations from growing and spreading disease. 100% elimination of the priority pests, cockroaches, rodents, and bedbugs, 
Inside each unit is difficult, but can be done and should be the goal. With an IPM team effort, pest problems can be reduced to isolated incidents that get taken care of before they grow and spread. It is possible to rid a unit of pests and clean up after them so that asthma attacks are reduced. For peer-reviewed research on these topics, visit the Research section on the Stop Pests website. Pests require three things to survive, food, water, and shelter. The three-legged stool illustrates this point. If we eliminate any of the three legs, pest infestations won't stand up. So the more of these we can remove, the more likely it is that pests will find somewhere else to live. In order to combat pests, we need to understand how they think and how they behave. It's a know-your-enemy strategy. We can then use what we've learned about their habits against them. Look at this illustration. As humans, we tend to think of a building in terms of its rooms. Bedrooms, living room, kitchen and bath all make a house a home. Pests look at things differently. Even though pests share our spaces, they prefer to remain out of sight. So they look for good hiding spaces when we're around and usually come out only at night when we're asleep. Because of this, they don't see the building the same way we do. To a pest, a home is the spaces between walls and around and in appliances. Any crack or hole is a door, and in between walls and floors is the safest place to travel and hide. Maintenance repairs will disrupt pest travel in hiding spots, making them easier to find and kill. The repairs also benefit the building. Take a moment to look around the room you're in right now. Is there a dropped ceiling? What's behind the electrical outlet? These areas are like pest superhighways. Pest management means that we are all on the lookout for signs of pests. We can't reasonably expect our PMP to be the only ones looking. Routine inspection, looking behind, under, and around, is a key component of an IPM program. Areas around appliances are especially attractive to pests, as they often combine good food and water sources with excellent hiding opportunities. Let's look at some tools that will help to make our inspections more thorough. First, we need a good flashlight. Using a bright light, even during daylight, can help us find pest infestations. We'll want to search for pest evidence, entry points, hiding spaces, and possible sources of food and water. But what about the spaces we can't readily see? Wouldn't it be great if we could see behind and underneath appliances without having to pull them away from the walls? One helpful tool is the telescoping mirror, which provides a view of places behind the appliance where we can't fit. And technology is improving all the time. Consider this wireless endoscopic camera, which works from your smartphone. You can get a view of any place the scope will fit and even take photos or videos with it, documenting what you see. Let's think through some of the problems that contribute to pest infestations. We'll develop our skills by reviewing the following photos. As you view each photo, see if you can spot what's the problem or the pest conducive condition, how would you fix it, and who is responsible for the fix. We'll give you a few seconds to examine the photo, then discuss our findings. Remember that pests are looking for food, water, and shelter. In this kitchen, we're providing all three. The problem, food on dishes and counters, water in the sink and in the drain board, provide the perfect midnight snack for pests. What's the fix? Cleaning and drying dishes nightly will go a long way to control the pest at no cost to the property. Who's responsible? The resident, with appropriate education, can eliminate these conditions. This example shows how knowledge of the pest, along with awareness of the environment, and a simple change in practices can result in pest management. In some homes, the pot of grease is left on the stove for later use. 
Did you know that one drop of grease can feed a roach for 20 days? The problem, this pot of cooking grease left on the stove provides dinner for pests. What's the fix? Proper storage and disposal of leftover food will remove food sources. Who's responsible? Once again, the resident with appropriate education can eliminate these conditions. This pot of water in the base cabinet provides water for pests, and the full pot indicates that this leak under the sink has been here for some time. The problem? Pot filled with water, catching an active leak under the sink. What's the fix? Leaks should be reported and repaired promptly. Who's responsible? Maintenance should respond promptly to reports of leaks. Mice and their sharp teeth can easily rip through standard food packaging such as plastic bags, paper, and cardboard. The problem. A mouse has eaten through the plastic bread bag in the kitchen, contaminating the contents. What's the fix? Transferring foods to more secure packaging, such as hard plastic or glass with tight-fitting lids, will keep mice out of our food. Who's responsible? The resident can use storage with tight-fitting lids to eliminate access. An overflowing dumpster is an open invitation to pests, especially rats who like to snack on the same food as humans. The problem? An open dumpster with trash, including mattresses, strewn over the surrounding ground. What's the fix? Dumpsters should be kept closed and emptied frequently to discourage rats from feeding here. Who's responsible? The facility should see that dumpsters are emptied frequently, and residents should be educated to always close the dumpster lids after use. When the stove top is dirty in an infested apartment, what do you think might be inside the stove? Yes, food and shelter. The problem. Grease on the stove is providing a dinner party for cockroaches. What's the fix? Stoves should be kept clean and free of grease. Who's responsible? Residents can be educated to keep these areas of the home clean. Note the holes or penetrations where plumbing pipes come through the walls. That's ample room for a pest to enter and set up housekeeping. The problem? This is roach frass under a sink, where cockroaches have easy access to water and shelter. What's the fix? Adding sealant around these holes and an escutcheon plate would stop the entry. Who's responsible? Facility maintenance should inspect for access points and eliminate them. Pests can travel through doorways, too. The problem. This gap along the door and deteriorated door sweep provide ample opportunity for pest entry. All three priority pests could fit through this opening. What's the fix? Replacing the door sweep and adjusting the door for a tight fit can keep pests out. Who's responsible? Facility maintenance should inspect for access points and eliminate them. This open trash bin might be feeding the roaches seen on this wall, and the photo was taken in the daytime. The problem? The open trash can is an invitation for pests to dine. What's the fix? Trash cans should have tight sealing lids and be emptied daily. Who's responsible? The residents, with appropriate education, can eliminate these conditions. Perhaps management would provide functional trash receptacles for all units. We can't tell if this is a current infestation or an old one. How will we know if pest treatments are working if we don't remove the old evidence? The problem. You can see abundant roach and mouse droppings on this kitchen floor. What's the fix? Old evidence, like dead bugs, shed skins, and droppings, must be removed. Left behind, they create health problems. Who's responsible? Maintenance should be involved in making permanent fixes to eliminate entry points. And residents must be educated that droppings and dead pests are still a health threat. It's clear that an attempt was made to close up this entry point. 
in a later session, we'll show you some more permanent solutions. Even clean units have enticements. The problem? Pet food provides food and water for pests, too. What's the fix? In an active infestation, these sources should be removed nightly and replaced in the morning. Who's responsible? Talk to residents about placing a tray under pet food and water dishes. This makes it easier to pick up spills from a sloppy eater and may even restrict some pests from feeding. We hope that these practical examples of IPM principles have been helpful. Now let's think about the intersection of healthy homes and IPM. The concepts of healthy housing and IPM are joined at the hip. Although there is no statutory definition of a healthy home, here is the one that the National Center for Healthy Housing uses. Healthy housing is designed, constructed, maintained, and rehabilitated in a manner that is conducive to good occupant health. Let's consider this list of eight hazard reduction strategies with the goal of creating healthy homes. Keep the home dry, clean, ventilated, safe, contaminant-free, maintained, thermally controlled, and pest-free. These eight points, or keep-its, can help us remember how to keep a home healthy. Many of these principles are interrelated. For instance, keeping a home well-maintained by repairing water leaks and sealing entry points also helps to keep it dry and pest-free. Keeping it dry reduces sources of water for pests. And of course, keeping a home pest-free ties in with several of the other principles. Fewer pests mean fewer pesticides or contaminants. Cleaning up dishes, harborage, and food sources to keep it pest-free are also part of the bigger principle of keep it clean. Protecting and maintaining a building for pest control will help make a building healthier for both occupants and property management staff. Let's see what HUD says about pest control. HUD has a commitment to IPM and supports its implementation by funding programs like this training and inspecting for pest infestation. HUD's promotion of IPM complies with the Federal Insecticide, Fungicide, and Rodenticide Act, or FIFRA. FIFRA states, in part, Federal agencies shall use integrated pest management techniques in carrying out pest management activities and shall promote integrated pest management through procurement and regulatory policies and other activities. You may already be familiar with many of the standards HUD relies on for ensuring the health and safety of their supported properties. One of those you may know best is the Real Estate Assessment Center, better known as REAC. There are specific pest provisions within REAC. During a REAC inspection, property receives a deficiency if the inspector sees evidence of rats, mice, or cockroaches. Evidence may be in the form of pest droppings or entry holes. REAC inspectors consider the presence of live roaches, mice, or rats, or more than one dead roach to be more serious and calls this an infestation. We'll talk more about this when we get to the specific module for each pest. There are also some key provisions of HUD's Uniform Physical Condition Standards, UPCS, and Housing Quality Standards, HQS, that relate to pests. Some quotes from these provisions include, Structures shall be kept free from insect and rodent infestation. Where insects or rodents are found, they must be promptly managed by approved processes, which are not injurious to human health. Proper precautions must be taken to prevent reinfestation. Currently, bedbugs are recorded but not scored during a REAC inspection, but that could change. HUD is developing a new inspection model for HUD programs to consolidate multiple physical condition requirements into a single regulation. The National Standards for the Physical Inspection of Real Estate, or NSPIRE, 
are being developed to reduce the regulatory burden on properties and improve HUD's oversight of health and safety hazards. You can find out more about Inspire at HUD.gov, including how to comment on the new standards and when to expect the new inspection standards to become official. What do your local codes say about pest control? Housing sites must comply with local housing and habitability codes. The International Property Maintenance Code, IPMC, is a common example. Section 309 addresses pest control. Do you know? Does your community have laws regarding bedbugs? Let's discuss some of the guidance that HUD provides on IPM. HUD has issued voluntary guidance on integrated pest management as early as 2006. The Public and Indian Housing Notice on Promotion of Integrated Pest Management was updated in 2011. Here is HUD's guidance on IPM. According to HUD's guidance documents, IPM offers the potential to ensure efficacy of pest elimination. Efficacy means the ability to produce a desired or intended result. IPM can protect the health of residents and minimizing the use of dangerous chemical treatments also protects the property management staff and the environment. When we seal up pest entry points and repair water leaks to control pest infestations, the life of the building is often extended. Since IPM methodologies are often permanent treatments, they can generate significant savings compared to the ongoing use of pesticides. IPM effectively eliminates pests in safer, longer-term, and cost-effective ways than traditional pesticide treatments. The full federal notice on HUD's IPM guidance can be found at HUD.gov. As with many processes, documentation is key. It is important to keep accurate, thorough documentation. Record-keeping brings accountability to pest management and ensures that problems are fixed before the infestation grows. Accurate record keeping can also protect your agency in the event of any legal complaints. One cohesive log for each building allows building managers and PMP to track pest trends within the building. We can then identify the units that have the highest level of infestation. We call these focus units because we want to focus most of our pest control resources in these units, enabling prompt action. An IPM log is one of the most essential pest control tools. Think of it as a master communication center for collecting and sharing information with everyone on the IPM team. The IPM log is a place to store all documents related to pest management. Any IPM-related information collected during HUD inspections should be transferred to the IPM log. Examples of such documents include schedules for treatments, notifications, pest management product information, licenses, and numerous other documents. Let's review a few sample documents. The Focus Unit Tracking Log, or SHEET, involves multiple departments, pest control, maintenance, resident support, etc. This is one way that we can provide a holistic or coordinated approach to IPM that unites sanitation, exclusion, repair, and controlled chemical use. This log highlights the treatment for focus units because of their higher level of infestation. Quickly addressing focus units is a key strategy in multifamily IPM. Here is a sample service log where we record all of the services the PMP performs, the types of pest present, the follow-up recommendations, and the condition of the unit relative to pest management. For all of the pesticides being used, the IPM log should also include both product labels and safety data sheets, also referred to as an SDS. This is the SDS for Transport Micron, a bed bug pesticide. And here's a close-up of the Transport Micron SDS cover page. Having quick access to detailed information on the pesticides in use can be very helpful to property management staff. Educational materials for staff and residents are an important component of IPM, and good graphics are an effective tool to illustrate how residents can support IPM activities. Be certain materials are available in the native languages of staff and residents. Here's another example of educational materials for residents describing their role in IPM on a two-sided trifold flyer. Here's the second page of that flyer. This customizable template is available at stoppest.org. 
Other forms that should reside in the IPM log include service schedule showing when PMP will visit and which units will be seen, applicator licenses for PMP personnel, proof of insurance and business registration for the PMP, potential notifications and preparation instructions for residents regarding PMP visits, contracts and service agreements between the facility and the PMP. It's critical that the facility reviews these contracts regularly and understands the provisions of the contract. Examples of log entries include locations of any traps and bait stations that are placed, notes about resident cooperation for follow-up by resident services, notes about needed repairs for follow-up by maintenance staff. Copies of work orders will need to be filed as well. Reviewing the IPM log will reveal patterns. It will also show the PMP the nature and location of problems so that they can respond appropriately. IPM won't be successful if it's implemented half-heartedly and embracing an IPM program may seem like more work. Property management will have to invest time and money to get caught up on repairs, but these repairs are essential to IPM in protecting the building from the damaging effects of moisture. Once fixed, the building must be maintained. Pest management will be an everyday event, as preventative measures will be taken so that pest levels are reduced and remain low. The Boston Housing Authority states that at the beginning of their IPM program, a lot of repair work was requested because unreported problems were finally reported. But then, as the repairs were made and pests were controlled, they experienced fewer work orders than before the IPM program began. In an IPM program, sometimes the use of pesticides is necessary and appropriate. Let's talk about pesticides for a moment. The EPA defines pesticides as any substance or mixture of substances intended for preventing, destroying, repelling, or mitigating any pest. The EPA takes great care to review these uses of pesticides to avoid impacts to people or the environment. But the EPA assumes that people will follow the pesticide label. Labels are the law, with instructions as to where and how the pesticide can be legally applied. In an IPM program, when pesticides are necessary, residents and staff should leave their application to the professional. PMPs take much longer courses to understand each of the pests, and that is why they are needed in any pest management effort. Address any pest questions to your PMP. Qualified PMPs should know all the answers or be willing to get them. Three key words are used on pesticide labels to define the relative risk to humans. These are caution, danger, and poison. With an IPM program in place, almost all infestations can be managed with a lower risk pesticide that says caution on the label, as they pose the least risk to humans. Danger or poison means that the pesticide product is highly toxic by at least one route of exposure. By self-treating with pesticides, residents and staff could unnecessarily expose themselves and their families to pesticides and make the pest problem worse. For these reasons, it makes sense to use reduced risk practices, to follow label instructions, and to practice prevention-based approaches that reduce reliance on chemical control measures. The elderly, pregnant women, and young children are at greater risk for adverse health effects associated with exposure to pesticides. Children are more vulnerable than adults because they are closer to the floor, do not have high tolerance for toxins, and put many things in their mouths. Pregnant women also are more vulnerable to pesticides. In addition, when exposed to pesticides, people with chemical sensitivities experience adverse reactions and will not be able to participate in daily activities. Under the Fair Housing Act, chemical sensitivities can constitute a handicap. Special attention must be given to people with chemical sensitivities so that they receive pest management services that meet their needs. Conventional pesticides should not be used in the units occupied by people with chemical sensitivities or in adjacent or neighboring units 
or in common areas such as the halls, lobbies, laundry rooms, elevators, or stairs, or along paths of travel for disability access. Property managers and maintenance crews must identify residents who are especially vulnerable to chemical exposure. Some residents may not be able to tolerate the presence of chemicals in their units, or they may feel that admitting a PMP to their unit may expose them to the pesticide present on the PMP's clothing. Working with residents is an important part of the property manager's responsibilities. There are a number of concerns related to pesticide use. Pesticides are considered illegal when they are not registered by the EPA or the state where they are used, or when they are used against the label. Illegal pesticides may be stronger than ones that are legal or approved for residential use. People may be tempted to purchase and use illegal pesticides because they are fast-acting. These products, commonly sold by street vendors, at ethnic markets, or through the Internet, are harmful to people and pets and should not be purchased or used. Pictured are two examples of illegal pesticides, Chinese chalk and tres pesitos. Pests often develop resistance to pesticides or develop an aversion or avoidance to baits. This is especially true for the pesticides that are available over the counter to the consumer. Consider instituting a pesticide buyback where residents can turn in the pesticides they have in their home and receive something of value. Could your agency provide cleaning kits or gift cards in return? The products commonly known as bug bombs are officially called total release foggers. In the hands of a consumer, they are prone to dangerous misuse. The propellant that spreads the insecticide through the air is flammable and can create an explosion. These photos show houses and apartments destroyed by bug bombs that were used incorrectly. They release a very fine mist of pesticides into the air from pressurized cans and pose the same risk of exposure as sprays. Further, according to a new study from North Carolina State University, total release foggers are ineffective at removing cockroaches from indoor environments. Researchers say bug bomb chemicals fail to reach places where cockroaches congregate the most, on the underside of surfaces and inside cabinets. Besides leaving numerous cockroaches, bug bombs also leave behind nasty toxic residue in the middle of floors and countertops, areas where cockroaches generally avoid, but which are heavily used by humans and pets. Pesticides are harmful to pests, and they aren't good for people either. How do we determine our risk from exposure to pesticides? The total risk associated with any pesticide is determined by both the toxicity of the chemicals it contains and the risk of a person being exposed to the product. Risk of exposure is the risk of a person coming in contact with a pesticide. Note that touching a pesticide that can be seen is not the only way we can be exposed to pesticides. Consider that pesticides can get into the air and remain on surfaces we touch, even when they can't be seen or smelled. Pesticides that are concealed in tamper-resistant packaging are much less harmful to humans than sprays that are released into the air. Rodenticides are some of the most toxic pesticides, but because they're placed in a tamper-resistant bait station, there's very little risk that humans will be exposed to them. This makes them safer than an insecticide spray or bug bomb that covers all of the surfaces in our homes. Another risk to consider is that someone could misuse a pesticide by applying it incorrectly, either for the wrong pest or using more product than the label prescribes. Here's a graphic from the National Pesticide Information Center on reading pesticide labels. All pesticides registered with the EPA will have this information on the label. The EPA registration number, which shows that the product was submitted to the EPA for evaluation. Precautionary statements, which list particular hazards to humans and pets, and in general, how the product can be used safely. And directions for use, storage, and disposal. 
it is not only dangerous to ignore these instructions, it is against the law. Remember, with an IPM program in place, almost all infestations can be managed with a pesticide that says caution on the label. Danger means that the pesticide product is highly toxic by at least one route of exposure. It may be corrosive, causing irreversible damage to the skin or eyes. Alternatively, it may be highly toxic if eaten, absorbed through the skin, or inhaled. If this is the case, then the word poison must also be included in red letters on the front panel of the product label. Pesticides, other than tamper-resistant stations containing bait, should be applied only by a licensed PMP. Residents, and even maintenance staff, can become complacent about the dangers of pesticides. But remember, just because they're available in many stores does not mean that they're safe or even effective. This photo shows the pesticide section of the grocery store, right next to the gift wrap and the Barbie display. So why do people tolerate exposure to pests and pesticides? Residents may have low expectations for pest control and maintenance, or feel their complaints won't be acted upon. They may have other priorities. Sometimes, residents are not even aware of the problems. They may not recognize the signs of infestation, or be aware that pesticides are harmful to humans. And sometimes, they've been accustomed to living with problems and simply cannot envision a better way. But there is a better way to manage pests than just using conventional pesticides. As we move into the pest-specific modules, you will learn solutions for dealing with the three priority pests that are most effective and safer for everyone who lives and works in housing. What have we learned? IPM is a decision-making process that emphasizes prevention, knowledge of pest biology, and the use of least disruptive control tactics with pesticides saved as a last resort. In a structural setting, an IPM program consists of inspection and monitoring, identification, scaling the response to the level of infestation, employment of two or more control measures, which may be mechanical, biological, chemical, or a behavior change and evaluation of effectiveness, which has us circle back to inspection and monitoring. As a review, successful IPM programs are the result of a team approach, an inspection and monitoring system that finds pests, a reporting system that identifies areas for improvement, units that are prepared to receive effective treatment, communication that empowers everyone involved, and fewer pests and a healthier environment. Thank you for participating in this online training module, an introduction to IPM. There are three additional modules in this series, one for each of the priority pests, namely cockroaches, rodents, and bedbugs. Please remember that many of the resources that we've mentioned are available on our website, stoppests.org. Please take the short quiz that follows for certification that you have successfully completed this module.